if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you probably know the verse, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And I just really felt like that was a word in season that we need to hear because there's despair is just floating through the atmosphere for a lot of different reasons. Certainly mourning of people who've passed away or people who are sick. No one likes to see people that they love suffer. But also the economic distress that people are feeling right now, being out of work and unemployment and you know, waiting long lines uh, to get funding for different projects. Uh, we're, we're believing God to just lubricate the system to defeat this virus because he's really good at destroying plagues <laughs> and to get the economy back in, in motion again and people back to work. And I'm, I'm sure most of us have a greater appreciation of how good we have it in America, how much freedom we have, because when the freedom gets taken away, you really notice it that I, I shouldn't have been taking it for granted the way I was. So I'll just read this, Psalm 61, four verses. It says, hear my cry, O God. And you could say that to him. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry out to you. And here's the verse I quoted earlier. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Okay, that's Jesus Christ. We just sang, I'm going to build my house on the rock, not on the sinking sand. And if you're new and this is all new to you and you don't know the Lord, you don't have a personal relationship, we, we keep holding up this bestseller of all time. It's called the Bible, and it's bestseller for a reason because it's the truth. It's the word of God. It's like a love letter to God's people, but it's also a place to set boundaries for our lives. When we don't know how to handle our lives, the word of God gives us that scaffolding to, to live within the boundaries that he sets for us so that when we're obedient to those, we prosper. And if you're feeling overwhelmed right now, we're telling you that he's the rock that the psalmist King David is talking about. When I'm feeling that, that horrible feeling of being overwhelmed with grief or emotion or fear, I can ask the Lord, lead me to the rock. Take this chaotic state that I'm in and bring me to safety and so that I can stand on that rock and that rock is higher than me. It's higher than I. When my heart is overwhelmed, Lord, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. And I speak that over you right now for anybody who's in distress or is, or is concerned about life right now because there's plenty of reasons in the natural to be. But all the more that we say greater is he that's in us than the demonic influences that are going on in the atmosphere right now that are around us. Psalm 61 verse 3 then says, For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. Could you say that? A strong tower from the enemy. That's who God is. He's a shelter for us. And verse 4, we make the declaration with the psalmist, I will abide in your tabernacle forever, and I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Again, loneliness is a form of torture. If you were put in prison, if, if they were upset with you about something, the way they punish you is put you in isolation, right? So this is, this is straight from the pit, but we have tools, and, and this is the main one, and your prayer life and worship time together with the Lord. Even if you're alone, you can still worship the Lord. You can take communion in your home like we've been trying to teach you here how important that is. We've been getting texts and, and emails from people from all over the world on our YouTube channel because we've been talking about this for quite a while, and... We're up to over 30,000 subscribers now, and, and we have people dialing in from Australia and New Zealand. Who knows what their background is? And they're saying, how could I take communion? Church is closed. <laughs> and we're saying, yeah, we understand that's part of, of, of a religious service in a formal setting, but you can have communion right where you are with the Lord. And it's good to kneel down and just sanctify that space and say, I'm committing myself back to you, Lord. When my heart is overwhelmed, you're taking me to that rock of stability in the midst of all this chaos. The other thing that's really good to do is, is take Jesus' advice all the time. But in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has en enough issues of its own, right? And, and the principle there is when you're in a crisis like we're in right now, don't think long term as much as you just take it a day at a time, a step at a time within your day, and try to keep a routine going. Because too much freedom can be a bad thing. You can lose discipline. And you can start tapping into all these counterfeit affections that the world offers us, including food. As important as food is for us to survive, we shouldn't be using it for comfort. Because then we get another reason to be upset with ourselves because of a lack of discipline. 
thankfully where we live, at least the weather's getting nicer and we can get outside and walk around and, and get some exercise. Just really good to keep your spirit man from getting in that slump and, and staying engaged with the Lord and with the word. I'm going to just read a couple more and, and give you a couple more declarative verses that you can use as weapons against that oppressive spirit that tries to come at you. And it's good to speak them out loud. I've read this one before, Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to that name and they are safe. All right, so keep that one, memorize that one, Proverbs 18.10. And then Psalm 94.22 says, the Lord has been my stronghold. And my God is my rock and refuge. Psalm 18.2, same wording. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. Okay, we celebrated that on this past Sunday with the resurrection, that the people of God were delivered out of the slavery and the bondage of Egypt into the promised land. It took them a while to get there, but they left the slavery, and they got reconditioned to be dependent on God. They were eating manna every day. They had no security other than to have to trust in the Lord. Cloud by day, fire by night. That's what we do. We're following after the presence of the Lord. Make these declarative promises of God over yourself. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. That's Psalm 18.2. And then David, um, when, when he was getting near the end of his life, he had written so many of the Psalms. And at this point in, in 2 Samuel chapter 22, at this stage, he had just been in the prior chapter. It describes how he'd been in battle, and he became weary, and one of the enemy almost killed him. And his men came to him and said, you're not going to be out here anymore because we're not going to lose your leadership over our nation. You've been an anointed leader as a king over our nation, and we're going to protect you. And, and David reflected on one of the psalms that he had written, and you can read it in 2 Samuel uh, 22. When I first became a Christian, these were the lyrics of a song that we would sing. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. This coronavirus is an enemy. It's coming after people, and we say, no, you cannot penetrate the protective barrier around me that the Lord gave me because I will call upon him. We just sang it. You're worthy to be praised, and I will be saved from my enemies. And then verse 5, I believe David is referring back to the battle where he was almost killed. He says, when the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol, which is another word for hell, surrounded me. And the snares of death confronted me. Seven says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. That's such a good pattern of life to do. Always call upon the Lord. Not just in your distress, but especially in your distress. And he says, and I cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry entered his ears. That's 2 Samuel 22, 7. I'm going to jump to verse 17, because this is how God responded. It says in 17, he reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of the deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. They might be too strong for me in the natural, but me and God make a stronger opponent to who is ever coming against us, right? Verse 20, he led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. Verse 21, the Lord rewarded me for doing right. He restored me because of my innocence. Okay, so that might sound like he's being a little self-righteous. No, there's a blessing in obedience, and there's a curse in disobedience. So it works both ways. And, you know, I just keep reflecting on how many conversations I've had with people. And, you know, the concept of stir-crazy comes up a lot. Like, I'm, I'm ca I got cabin fever. I can't take just being in the house all the time. You have, to, you have to be aggressive against that thing that would try to cloak you in that depression. And you have to use the word of God and, and worship and, and try to help other people. Call people that you know and say, you know, if you're comfortable with this idea, go to the store and get them some food and bring it to them. And, and that, that works against the spirit that's trying to work against you. You're operating in the opposite spirit. All right. And I'm going to just use two other portions of scripture tonight um, that bring out this idea of being in distress and calling out to the Lord um, and, and what we can do when we're in this situation. And, you know, the word faith, one of my mentors was a guy named John Wimber, and he used to sell, say faith is spelled R-I-S-K, 
okay? Now, I know that's not how you spell it, but he was getting the point across that if God is asking you to do something, there's usually not an easy, uh, clear sight answer for it. If there was, it wouldn't require faith. But because faith is risky, you, uh, you have to step out, you know, like Peter getting out of that boat. And John Wimber used to use the example, I'll just come over here for a minute, he would say, it's like you're on a diving board, and there's a pool down there, but the pool's empty. Sorry, I'm too close to the speaker. <laughs> and, and God is saying, I want you to jump. And you, you look at an empty pool and you say, well, fill it up with water first, and then I'll jump. See, that's not so risky, is it? But then God says, no, after you step off the diving board, I'll fill it up on your way down. <laughs> that's R-I-S-K. But that's often how we feel when God is showing us and asking us to do something and giving us an assignment. It's usually above what we think we can do in the natural. You remember when he met that man with the withered hand and he said, stretch forth your hand. He was asking him to do something that he couldn't do up to that point. He, he, we have to cross over. Peter, come to me. Step out of the boat and come to me. Well, in the natural, he couldn't, but he had the faith to step out. And we have to have the faith to beat the coronavirus or any of the other uh, unintended consequences of, of the isolation, including our job losses or even just if we're furloughed. And we, we will have a job. We will be able to go back to our job, but just not yet. Still hurting for the finances. But I, I have faith to believe, just like God... Uh, brought, used the ravens to bring Elijah meat and, he, and gave him the brook to drink that God's going to provide for us. That's who he is. So if you want to go to Second Chronicles chapter 20, we read about a man named Jehoshaphat. He's the king. And if uh, you're familiar with the story, you probably have heard of him before because there's just this amazing series of events that happen. And he is known for what we're about to read. That's one of the things that he's famous for. So he's the king, and they're basically under siege as, as a city, and there's a big army coming against him. And in verse 2 of 2 Chronicles 20, messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, the king, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea, and they're already at En Gedi. Okay, so the enemy is on the move, a big army coming against them. Verse 3, it says Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news. Now that in itself is not uncommon to man. It's just what we do with it after we get that, right? And a couple of weeks ago, I talked about a man named Jairus who came to Jesus because his daughter was ill, and he was a leader of the synagogue. He wasn't even technically a Christian, but he was so desperate to see his daughter get healed that he came to Jesus. And on the way, they got sidetracked by the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus was about to go to Jairus' house, but he got slowed down healed this woman with the issue of blood. And in the meantime, one of Jairus' servants came and said, don't bother the master, your daughter is dead. And Jesus, without hesitation, said two words, fear not. And then two more words, only believe. Fear not, only believe. But you could do a lot worse than focusing on those four words. Fear not, only believe. Jehoshaphat was terrified. And what did he do? He prayed. He begged the Lord for guidance, it says. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. Now, that's hard to do in this environment because we have so much free time on our hands and there's so much stuff in our food closets. It's really tempting to go eat even if you're not hungry because it's comforting. So going on a fast at a time like this would really be a good thing to do because you have to teach your flesh who, who's the boss here. And Jehoshaphat wanted to make sure that the whole country was tuned in and hearing from the Lord. And when you fast, that's what happens. You get more spiritually alert and awakened, and, and he ordered it as the king. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. And verse 9, Jehoshaphat is speaking to the Lord, and he's saying, whenever we're faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine. Does that sound familiar? We're faced with a plague. And, and if you're out of work, it feels like a famine because you're not sure what the future holds. He says, whenever we're faced with any calamity, such as a war, plague, or a famine, verse 9, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. That's different than being terrified, isn't it? See, he went from that initial state when he heard the news, and he, and he got that bad report about the army that was 
coming against him. And he said, you know what? We're going to call a fast. We're bringing everybody into Jerusalem, and we're going to pray, and we're going to seek the face of the Lord. Now, when you do that, he might come back to you with a plan that's different than the one you were expecting. It's human nature. Well, how's he going to do it? Well, be careful. We said also often, get the how out of here. Because the how is what gets us in trouble. We play all these what-if games, and God's bigger than our how. He can do it in a way that you've never even thought of, but you need to be keeping your ear tuned to him, all right? So verse 10, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 10, says, Now we see, he's, he's praying, he's speaking to the Lord, that these armies are coming against us from Moab and Ammon. Verse 11, They've come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? And then he says this very humble thing. We are powerless against this mighty army that's about to attack us. We don't know what to do, but we're looking to you. And that's another great thing to remember. It's 2 Chronicles 20, 12. In another version, it says, when we don't know what to do, our eyes are on you. Easy to remember. When I don't know what to do, my eyes are on you, Lord. Give me that answer. Give me that download from heaven. Verse 14 says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaziel. All right, so this is the beauty of corporate worship and why the enemy is trying to keep us from meeting together because we can amplify our worship when we come together and, and the enemy is trying to keep us apart. But we're not apart. We are together this way. And soon enough, we'll be back together again. So he brings all the people to Jerusalem. They're fasting and praying. And now a man who's not well known in the Bible gets a prophetic word. And verse 15, he says, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Do you have anybody in your life like that? Do you have people that you can go to and say, I really need you to agree with me in prayer because I need to hear from the Lord on what to do. In the natural, there are no easy solutions. In fact, it looks really good bad in the natural. And this man gets a word. And it could be anybody in your circle. It doesn't have to be somebody who's got the uh, label or the title of a prophet. It's great to know those people. But God's not limited by that. And this is what he says, the first thing in verse 15, the Lord says, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. Here we go. Memorize this one. For the battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. All right? That's a really good one to remember. The battle belongs to the Lord. Verse 17. This sounds like it would need a lot of faith to believe what he's about to say. He says, you won't even need to fight. Take your positions and then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. That would take some faith, don't you think? You've got this big army coming against you. And if you know that you're hearing the voice of the Lord, that gives you the confidence to say, okay, God's got a plan. He's in it with us. And just on a personal level, I can tell you that with all the curveballs that have been thrown at us over this move to the deaconry, and now the construction has stopped because there's a ban on construction, it's like every day there's another plate that you're trying to spin when you're, when you're leading. But the prophetic words that we've gotten over the years that God is in this move has really helped us to know that we don't have to know how he's going to do it. We'll take it a day at a time. We'll be sitting by the, by the river like Elijah and waiting for God to send the raven and bring the bread. That's, that's how we're looking at this. We can't allow doubt and unbelief to become a stronghold in our lives. That becomes powerful in its own right, and you destroy those strongholds of unbelief. He's on our side. He is for us. <laughs> All right, so this man, Jehaziel, has a great word. He says, don't be afraid. The battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. Take your position and then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. And then he goes on to say, and this is a good way to remember this, 2 Chronicles 2020. So we're in the year 2020, and 2020 vision gives us a clue that this verse is about vision too. Jehoshaphat, now the king, stopped and said, listen to me, all you people. Believe in the Lord your God, and you'll be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. That's a really important concept, don't you think? You have to know that you can rally around the words that come from reliable people that you know know how to hear the voice of the Lord. We all do. But in this case, this man, Jehaziel, this man, Jehaziel got a prophetic word exactly for that situation. And in the Bible, the, the anointing for that is, is labeled as the sons of Issachar. 
we would say the Issachar anointing is because it says about them that they knew the times and the seasons and they knew what Israel should do. And that's very appropriate for us right now. You can ask the Lord, give me those downloads. I want to be able to hear your voice so clearly that I can separate it from the counterfeit voices that are coming at me. So he's, Jehoshaphat the king is endorsing this man Jehaziel's word and saying, believe his prophets and you will succeed. Verse 21, after consulting the people, oh, I love this, he appointed singers to walk ahead of the army. How brilliant was that? And what a great picture for us today. How if we want to be in alignment with the Lord, Chuck Pierce says this often, Judah goes first, the tribe of Judah. It's David's tribe. He was a worshiper. They're the worshipers, among other things that they are. And here, King Jehoshaphat gets his picture around this prophetic word, and he appoints the singers to walk ahead of the army. That's, that's not a common tactic because they don't have weapons, right? And if the enemy's coming against you, so the Lord is basically telling us that our worship is a weapon, that that goes before us. It clears the atmosphere. If you heard Trisha on Friday night, I believe that was the night she told the story when she was a young Christian. She was going, uh, her, the person who was mentoring her was meeting in the YMCA in Patterson, and there was a drunk guy that was, that was tr harassing her and tried to pin her up against the wall. And she said, but in the name of Jesus, I command you to get off of me and stop. And she plead, pled the blood over this man, and he put his hands over his ears and said, stop saying that name telling you your voice has power and and when you speak in agreement with the word of god it's got power to help you but when you contradict the word of god with your mouth you open up the door to the enemy so Jehoshaphat's telling them to do something that they would have probably never come up with on their own he's saying i'm going to send the singers first singing to the lord praising his name for his holy splendor and this is what they sang give thanks to the lord his faithful love endures forever as they're going into the battle, and verse 22 says, at that very moment, I'm going to ask you, I can't hear you, but say it with me, at that very moment, I can hear you, Easter, thank you, at that very moment that they started to speak out into the atmosphere, give thanks to the Lord, his faithful love endures forever, that became a weapon against the enemy, at that very moment, in verse 22, that they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. Amen. Now, you wouldn't have probably come up with that idea as a battle strategy. How could you get the enemy to fight among themselves? You're not God. All they had to do was hear the word, trust the word, follow through on what he said, and then he did it in a way that they never could have anticipated or expected. And God still is operating that way today. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. You've got to step out of the boat. You've got to do things that don't always seem logical. And let me tell you, if you have a lot of unsafe friends and you are a Christian, you could be swayed by them of telling you how ridiculous something sounds, but that's not the voice you want to obey. And the word's real clear about this. The things of the spirit cannot be understood by the carnal mind. So if you're talking to unbelievers to get your advice, you're, you're unequally yoked. And this is a matter of life and death right now. You have to hear the voice of the Lord. So I've got just a few more minutes left, so I'm going to take you to 2 Kings chapter 6. And since you have some time, I would encourage you to read prior 5, 6, 7. It's just an awesome portion of scripture. The prophet Elijah, who I was telling you was the one sitting by the brook waiting for the ravens to bring him bread, he mentored a man with a similar name named Elisha. Elijah with a J, Elisha with an S. Okay, that's his uh, apprentice, we would say. But, but before Elijah left, uh, Elisha, the apprentice, asked for a double portion. And he received a double portion anointing of this tremendous prophet, Elijah. I mean, he, you, you have not because you ask not. He had the boldness to ask, and he got it. And you just see miracle after miracle after miracle. It's, it's worth a big study, which I can't do right now because I don't have the time. But it's a similar situation. If you read verse 30 of, of 2 Kings 6, you're going to read about the king of, of Israel. It says, when the king heard this, he tore his clothes in despair. And I'm sorry to start in the middle of the story. But this city was under a siege. And it was so bad 
that the people were starting to cannibalize their own children, okay? And it doesn't get any worse than that, all right? If you're in a famine, it could not get any worse than that. And this king had been counting on Elisha. His name was Jehoshaphat. No, I'm sorry, I just told you. It's Jehoram, sorry, excuse me. And he was counting on Elisha, and, and, and he was just basically at the end of his rope. You told me to trust the Lord. You told me to trust the Lord. Look how bad this situation is. God's not in this. And Elisha was saying, no, you stand firm. And this is somewhat by implication because I can't unpack the whole teaching for you right now. But you have to know that when, when a king is in despair, that could be a problem because he's not centered on God. He's now being driven by his fear. And you might remember King David. I talk about this a lot. Uh, when a man named Nabal insulted his troops and wouldn't feed him, David got in the left the spirit realm and got in the flesh, and he told his men, strap on your swords, okay? He wasn't hearing from God. He was listening to his flesh. And now this king, Jehoram, is saying the same thing. Enough. The people are, you told me to wait on the Lord, and he's not coming through in my time frame the way I expected him, so I'm going to take matters in my own hands, and I'm going to kill you, Elisha because you're a false prophet, because it hasn't come to pass. He wasn't a false prophet, but when the king is upset like this, he's got the power to execute you. So he, uh, in verse 31, the king is so upset. Well, he's, it says in verse 30, he tore his clothes in despair. That's that tipping point moment. When you're in despair, you start to lose good judgment because you're hijacked emotionally. And now all he can think about is, I shouldn't have listened to this guy, Elisha. It was wrong, and now the people are cannibalizing their own children, and I got to kill this guy because I'm so angry with him. Right? And 31 says, may God strike me and even kill me if I don't separate Elisha's head from his shoulders this very day. I don't want the king saying that. <laughs> Verse 32 of 2 Kings 6 says, Elijah was sitting in his house with the elders of Israel when the king sent a messenger to summon him. But before the messenger arrived, Elijah got a prophetic word. This is the same guy that in the prior chapter was giving the king advice because he could hear the strategy plans from a distance away not because he could hear it in the natural. The Lord would show him what the enemy was doing. And, and, the, and the enemy king thought there was a spy in the camp. And, and his staff said, no, it's not a spy. It's this guy, Elisha. He knows what you do in your bedroom. So same thing here. The king issues an edict and says, go find Elisha and kill him. Well, he gets that in the spirit. And he knows the king is sending a messenger to kill him. So as he's sitting in his house... Again, this is verse 32 of 2 Kings 6. Elisha says to the elders that are with him, a murderer has sent a man to cut off my head. He's talking about the king. The king is the murderer. And this messenger is on the way to cut off his head. And this is what Elijah says. When he arrives, shut the door and keep him out. We will soon hear his master's steps following him. Verse 33. While Elisha was saying this, the messenger arrived and gave the message. The king has said, all this misery is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? And that's my word for you tonight. This is what I feel like the Lord really wanted me to share. It's be careful. Just because you're not seeing the answer that you thought you would see by now, or you've seen some bad things happen already, doesn't mean the Lord has, has abandoned you. He hasn't abandoned you. You don't want to make your decisions out of despair. When my heart is overwhelmed, Lord, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Why so downcast, O oh, my soul? Another verse. Put your trust in God. You need to speak to yourself and say, despair, you don't win. Even if you go in the, in the bathroom and look in the mirror and say, despair, you're not going to win. My God is for me. He's not against me. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans he has for me, and they're plans to succeed. Just because I don't see how it's going to happen doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And boy, this is really good. Why, the king says to Elisha, why should I wait on the Lord any longer? And Elisha replied, all right, give this message back to the king. This is what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow, the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver. So basically, you're going to go from cannibalizing your own children to having more than enough food at a, at a big surplus and a discount. 
and 12 quarts of barley grain will cost only one piece of silver. And we like to give you that. Easter was just saying it. Tomorrow, about this time, devil, things are going to change. You make that your confession. It's right out of the word of God. 2 Kings 7, 1. By this time tomorrow. Tomorrow, about this time, things are going to be different, devil. My spirit isn't going to feel crushed. My spirit isn't going to feel under despair. When my heart is overwhelmed, I go to the rock. And that rock is way higher than I and above my uh, decision, decision making. Now, here's the key thing uh, of the rules of engagement. The man that came to give, you know, to cut Elijah's head off, the messenger, here's that word. Elijah said, you go back and tell the king, this is what the Lord says. Tomorrow about this time, things are going to be ra radically different. And this is what the man says in verse 2. The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, that couldn't happen. See, you got to get the how out of here. That couldn't happen. That's death coming out of his mouth. Death and life are in the power of our tongue. That couldn't happen because he couldn't conceive it in his limited brain. But God is bigger than our limited brain. Thank God. Ha! Huh. The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, that couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. This guy is really in despair. But Elijah replied, oh, really? You'll see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. By your mouth, you cursed yourself. You can't ever say God couldn't do it. But that's what he did in verse 2. In verse 3 of 2 Kings 7, says, Now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the gates of the city. And they looked at each other, basically said, Why should we sit here waiting to die? They asked each other. We'll starve if we stay here. But with the famine in the city, we'll starve if we go back there. So we might as well go and surrender to the Aramean army. And if they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. That's called being at the end of your rope. And we like to say God's address is the end of your rope. <laughs> if you want to know where you're going to meet God, it's when you feel that despair and nothing in the natural looks like it's working. Everything's caving in and crashing. No, that's exactly where he lives. When you're at the end of your rope, that's when you call out to him, and he'll make himself real to you. I promise you that. So this is a pretty famous portion of Scripture, 2 Kings 7, because these four lepers don't have a whole lot of faith, do they? They basically have a death wish on their life, and they say, well, look, we're going to die anyway, so we might as well go try and go in the enemy's camp and see if they'll have mercy on us. So they're not walking in any kind of faith that God is moving. And as they go, in verse 4, it says, we will starve if we stay here, but if, um, I, I read that already, didn't I? So we might as well go out and surrender to the Aramean army, and, and we'll see if they'll let us live. Verse 5, so at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Arabians, okay? It's the end of the day. They're thinking we're probably walking into our own execution here. Our lives are over. But when they came to the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord, this is verse 6, okay, 2 Kings 7, 6. For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and galloping horses and the sounds of a great army approaching. Four lepers with no faith sounded like a great army approaching. Can you believe this? How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? If you're willing to be obedient. I mean, they really didn't even have a word from the Lord. But four lepers who think they're about to die cause the whole other army to flee. God can do anything. Amen. Don't try to figure out how he's going to do it. That's my word for you tonight. Don't ever say like this assistant to the king, that couldn't happen. Because he's way bigger than our imagination and what we can think. Verse 7, I'll end 2 Kings 7, 7. So they panicked and ran into the night, the, uh, the army, the Aramean army. They panicked, ran into the night, abandoning their tents and their horses and their donkeys and everything else as they fled for their lives. So the Lord caused the sound in both cases. The Lord caused the sound, right? With Jehoshaphat, the singers go forth. The sound goes into the enemy's camp, and that confuses them, and they start fighting each other because they had the faith to be obedient to what looked like an impossible word from God, but sound. God used sound to break open heaven. Now these four lepers are about to die, 
and God can make them walking sound like an army. I'm going to read it again. The Lord caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots, galloping horses, and the sound of a great army approaching. That's what they heard. And they fled. And they left all their food, all their possessions, all their resources. Again, you just on your own time can go read this over because it's so powerful. These lepers don't know what to do with themselves when they get there. They're so happy. They think they're about to die. And they walk in and they just hit this huge, big mother load of, of resource. And they, they start taking it and hiding it because they're like, can this really be true? They're not here. Maybe they're going to come back. Let's go hide this stuff. And then after a while, they get convicted. It's like, no, if we don't go back and tell the people of Israel, there's going to be judgment on us. So they go back. And the king is so desperate, he thinks, no, this is a trap. The Aramean army just left to, to fool us, to get us to come out. See, that's what, that's what happens. You get all these layers of unbelief trying to build a stronghold in your life. And we're here to tell you, no, God is greater. Amen? Say amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and if you're panicked, you know, that's, that's this word that's right here in 2 Kings 7, 7. Again, we just want to speak words of life. We want to release sound into the atmosphere that will counter the plans of the enemy. Okay, the weapons of our warfare. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse, starts with verse 3. The weapons of our warfare are not in this natural realm. They're not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the to the dis demolishing of strongholds, okay? So God has given us these supernatural weapons for the natural world that we live in. And I'm just going to agree with you by faith tonight that you are not going to be tormented, that you're not going to be bound by fear, that this isolation, you're going to work it, God will work it to your advantage. He said in Romans 8, 28, he makes all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And you can use this time to, to just get deeper into the word. I believe in some of you are journaling out there and, and there's a book that's being released somehow that's been pent up on the inside of you and, and God used this stoppage in your regular schedule to free up time for you to write. So many other things. There's so many resources available. If you have online access, good and bad. So I'm just going to speak over you now and, and I just want to close and, and just ask Step out in faith. Even if the Lord is showing you something that doesn't look like it makes a whole lot of sense, really test to see if it's him. And if it is him, you're going to get a victory out of this situation. It put it strongly on my heart to, to just use both of these stories to just encourage you. Release a sound into the atmosphere that's going to cause a breaking, right? Take every thought captive. Break that stronghold of unbelief. So, Lord, I just lift up every person who's watching, everybody that's here right now. We thank you that you are greater. Your love is stronger than the hate of the enemy. The, the plan that you have for us is, is way better than the plan of destruction that he has for us. He's a thief, but you said you came to give life, not to destroy it. So help us, Lord, not to blame you for the bad things that are happening when we know there's an opposing force the enemy the devil is trying to steal kill and destroy we will not be confused about who this is coming from it's not from the lord it's from the enemy and the lord wins maybe in an unusual way we don't know how he's going to do it but we know he is going to do it if you don't know the lord i pray call out to him you can go back and watch this from the beginning It'll, it's on our facebook page and, and and just take some notes down and say no that makes sense what he was saying it's finally starting to click for me and it's starting to make sense and just like they cried out to the lord in their time of distress you cry out to the lord and we'll just do it right now easter i'm just going to ask you would you just lead in a prayer right now because um, i just sense you have it there's a microphone right there and and just Take a minute and listen to what she's saying. Process it in your spirit and be in agreement with it. This has been a mighty word from the Lord. And it's an invitation for those who do not know him. Who really said sometimes in your heart, do, is God real? <laughs> he's real. There's a song. He's real. He's real. He's mighty real. And he said, when you ask him, he will come. The scripture before said, when you seek him with all of your heart, he will be found. Yeah. So just pray after me if you would. Say, Father, 
And I do call you Father. I come in the name of your son Jesus. And I know that there's no other name. And I know there's no other name. Whereby man shall be saved. Whereby man shall be saved. So I'm calling on the name of Jesus. So I'm calling on the name of Jesus. Because I'm in a place where I cannot help myself. Because I'm in a place where I cannot help myself. And I'm tired. And I'm tired. I receive you, Lord Jesus. I receive you, Lord Jesus. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose from the dead. I believe you died and rose from the dead. For me to have life. For me to have life. So I receive you. So I receive you. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Oh, and I thank you. And I thank you. I can feel the peace already. I can feel the thank peace. You, Lord thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So we'll be back again on Sunday. We might have another service during, during the week. I'm not sure. We did that last week for Good Friday, and it was really great to just be able to, to be together and release sound out into the atmosphere. To be determined, keep an eye on our social media. And I just bless you. Uh, I thank you for spending time with us. I bless you to receive all, all of God's promises. They're yes and amen. And uh, hopefully you can join us again Sunday, and we'll see you then. Have a great night.